Hello and welcome uh, to the EPRS event on the importance of the euro in the global economy, an online roundtable by the European Parliamentary Research Service. It's a pleasure to have you and it's a pleasure to have a very distinguished uh, panel for today's discussion. Today's event is a part of a longer series by EPRS. Um, the, uh, our, our audience who has been following us so faithfully knows this. We have been running a series on the euro at 20. And today we will look at the external dimension. My name is Lasse Böhm. I'm the head of the economic policies unit in the European Parliamentary Research Service. Uh, and it's my pleasure to open today's event before later on passing the moderator button to my colleague Isam Halak, who is a policy analyst at EPRS and a specialist in international finance. Today's event, of course, comes against the background of rising inflation and the feeling of uncertainty over the economic future of the EU as a whole. We will use this event to discuss the current role and future potential of the euro. So we will ask questions like, to what extent is the euro a global reserve currency? And what is the relationship between the euro and the EU strategic sovereignty? I'm very pleased to be able to open this event with um, a very distinguished guest and member of the European Parliament, Professor Danuta Hübner. Professor Hübner has previously been uh, in various events and uh, always shared her rich experience, not only as a member of the European Parliament, but also as a European Commissioner and a Minister for European Affairs of Poland. Uh, Mrs. Hübner, it's a pleasure to have you back at EPRS and the floor is yours for the opening statement. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lasse, for, for really having this idea of getting us together to talk about the importance of the euro, because I, as far as I know, not only us in this panel and in the U U European Parliament Research Service uh, believe that euro is a good thing, it's just two thirds of Europeans see the euro as a good thing, as the most uh, meaningful uh, symbol of the European integration, and also, as we all know, the number of member states that have adopted uh, the, the common currency continues to grow. And we are very happy. I mean, we coming from the uh, uh, so-called new member states um, are extremely happy that as of 2023, one more of those uh, Central East European, actually South in this case, uh, member will, Croatia will, will join the European Union. And that means actually that we will have nearly 90% of the EU GDP generated in the euro area and also close to 80% of the EU population living uh, there. But uh, you're right, uh, globally also the euro is important. And globally, actually, euro means uh, Europe. Uh, very few people are aware of other currencies of the European Union. And it has... Uh, become, I think, especially recently, uh, Euro has become a channel for the proliferation, proliferation of the European values of democracy, of free markets, international cooperation. And the aggression of Putin, I think, reminded us once more of the importance uh, and relevance of European values and, and democracy, but also of the risks and uncertainty in the global world divided between democracies and, and uh, autocracy, authoritarian um, regimes. And this also matters, I think, for the global uh, role of Euro. Uh, and this current uh, geopolitical environment matters for our conversation also in the sense that this context carries uh, significant uncertainty and downside risks that come from the global uh, world. We also know that as globalization is, is just uh, undergoing a, a remodeling with the with its roots actually shifting from purely efficiency and cost related basis towards resilience and security oriented uh, roots, which are related to geopolitics and also uh, values. We also see that the demand and supply side inflationary pressures will not disappear overnight and that monetary and public spending policies operate in a framework which is a combination of factors reducing the efficiency of the policies and also producing global spillovers. And most of those issues should be left for another debate. I know it perfectly, but I, I am mentioning them here because I think they do have relevance for the strategic importance of the uh, euro and the choices we are making currently as the European um, Union. I think there is a generally shared view that the international role of the European a currency remains below its potential and it is our strategic interest to, to reap the potential benefits of a stronger role of the euro in the global world. And uh, I would say that since its inception, the euro's international positions, position was entirely left to market forces. And we have 
still realized gradually uh, that with supportive policies, the euro can become a currency that is more widely welcome, used, and also trusted. And also, I think it, uh, ECB allows me to say that ECB seemed to have departed also from its historically neutral stance regarding the promotion of euro as a global uh, currency. So then finally, in 2018, President Jean-Claude Juncker of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, highlighted the, the, the need to, to ensure the single currency uh, plays its full role on the international uh, scene. And then we had many studies exploring how Euro delivers on different functions of global currency, uh, because we all know that we have actually the second global currency, but it's far, far behind the, the first. So all those thoughts about the, the Euro have added, I would say, a new dimension to the open strategic autonomy discussions on on and on related policy uh, making. And, and I think that today's discussion implies also the need of looking at the Euro uh, global uh, role in the context of unfavorable global spillovers, largely due to the lack of effective coordination of monetary policies in major uh, jurisdictions. And we have become aware that enhancing the relevance of Euro globally is not a short walk in the park, and we once we start this walk, uh, it will not be without hurdles, and this is reality. Uh, uh, and it is a long-term market-driven process with a well thought through and orchestrated addition of multiple policies facilitating the, the process. That's how I see this um, process. And now our goal is not to make also Euro the, uh, the only um, uh, leading currency replacing other, currencies, but rather to aim for a multipolar system, friendly, cooperative, in which several currencies have a, a role uh, to play. Um, so now, under this concept of open strategic autonomy, uh, we are called to make a choice to politically support the euro as part of a wider strategy to better enable Europe to to play um, a leading role in global economic governance and enhance also our political resilience and our new policy um, uh, agenda. So in, in my view, responding to the question, which is constantly raised by some people, that should we leave it to market forces um, or should we rather have policies to help? I think making the role of the euro stronger requires uh, relevant policies uh, covering many areas and the number of those areas I think is growing to the global context. It's not only international trade, it's not only financial services and capital markets or payment systems, but also climate change and also digital transformation. And now we have added, I think, energy and foreign and securities policies to those uh, policies. So it is about creating a policy environment in all those areas that would be conducive to enhancing the role of the euro uh, globally. And two years ago, we had a debate without the war challenge and the fully fledged energy uh, crisis. But even then, we knew that we couldn't ignore challenges that emerge uh, globally when we uh, think of the uh, role of the of the euro. So uh, still, I, I would say today, we, we look at the past towards increased global euro relevance in a in a different environment and with the actually full uncertainty or close to full uncertainty about the future. Um, and the multiple crisis context led to the, the EU to reaching out to financial markets and borrow on the basis of debt denominated euro. And this is, I think, today already a fact of life, a, a novelty. And this has made the issue of international position of euro simply a more pragmatic one, which I think is extremely important. And this has also impact on our debate on euro safe assets, which I also think is extremely um, uh, important. Then the fact also that we experience those global spillovers of policies in another jurisdictions influencing the value of our currency and also the inflation in our uh, currency, I, I think it adds also to the ECB concerns. I would be happy to hear your reaction regarding the links between the global currency status and the monetary policy, both in terms of monetary autonomy and also global transmission of monetary uh, policy. Current developments, I believe, make it legitimate uh, to say that EU, EMU, so the euro area, 
broadly understood reforms alone cannot deliver more powerful globally um, euro just as a byproduct i think we we need and again i'm re repeating it uh this these supportive um, uh, policies and we also know that it will take time when we talk about the process back in um, to go back to my report i think that in early 2021 the the resolution that we uh, adopted had as, as a core message uh, that to protect the European Union's interest and reinforce its geopolitical position, uh, which was not that um, uh, important at that time, the EU should focus on using economic strengths strategically and deploy its financial firepower and also complete important integration uh, projects. And we see that th this continues to be uh, true today, to be important uh, today. In the report, we focused on the reforms and policies that can make our currency credible globally, and that in turn would enhance the international competitiveness of the European markets and also strengthen the stability and attractiveness of our currency and attract so badly needed uh, investments. So the resolution was clear that the long-term international role of the currency of the European Union goes beyond the currency as such. It will largely also depend on the euro area's attractiveness as a location to do business the as the decision to use a currency is ultimately determined by market participants' preferences. So confidence in the stability of our currency is a crucial component, I think, that influences the, its choice. And it is as well an important criterion for central banks and governments in determining the composition of, of their international uh, reserves. I would say that we all know that two years after the report, there are some good news on the banking union. At least we see that ESM has been just uh, getting a hard look and it's improved. And also the common backstop for the uh, SRF entered into force. Maybe deposit insurance guarantee schemes at national level will get some fine tuning, but lack of agreement on a common European deposit insurance scheme on the famous EDIS essentially means that the banking union, um, uh, which is the union of our currency, will continue to be lacking um, uh, one of its uh, three uh, pillars and most likely it will not be implemented in the foreseeable future. Uh, we are working seriously on the strengths and capital market union because it would promote the role of the euro in international marketplace as deep and liquid domestic financial and euro denominated capital markets, I think are absolutely essential for a currency to achieve and raise its international status. So this is a fundamental uh, requirement. Yet, even here, we continue to see under development and segmentation of the euro areas capital markets along national lines, along vertical silos. So as a result, we have small size and fragmented uh, markets. I think among the successes of the last uh, two years, I would mention overcoming uh, this hesitancy of emitting European debt, uh, both in sure uh, and also in the recovery and resilience um, uh, facility. Uh, we continue also to work on euro uh, as the world standard setter for green bonds and leading currency of denomination for the issuance of such bonds. So that's internationally also extremely um, uh, important. Uh, but uh, I, I think that um, uh, the, the, we need to foster the use uh, of the euro in pricing and invoicing in trade transactions and uh, promote its use in EU trade agreements, especially the area of energy. We have now, I think, an opportunity that hopefully will never repeat itself, but we signed 56 of, of the new deals, which are unfortunately not transparent, but I hope that they have price mechanisms which is based on, um, uh, on euro. Um, I would also say that um, in, in uh, fundamental messages of 2021 um, uh, resolution, uh, on the euro uh, global the role of euro is as valid today as as it, as it was uh, two years uh, ago. I also hope that now the work on the macroeconomic uh, governance and on the new European fiscal framework will also pave the way towards fiscal stability. That would be extremely helpful also for the uh, for the euro. And I am also hoping that the euro as a currency will benefit from the ECB and. Work on the launch of the digital 
euro, this is uh, and, and just very important. And just to, to complete, let me say that um, globally meaningful euro can facilitate EU's global effective engagement, but this is a two-way street, actually. And euro can also benefit from, the, from this EU's global engagement, uh, from the EU capacity to build global alliances with like-minded uh, democracies. So uh, we, we, there are also risks still, and we continue to see that uh, euro does not benefit evenly uh, all the euro area members this is something which is uh, which the ecb is, is is making an effort to to address so there are still a uh, risk but uh, that allows me only to say at the end what we normally say in the european union a lot has been achieved but but a lot remains to be to be done and and we need all, all hands on board for uh, for this to to make euro really just flourish as a global currency thank you thank you Ms. hübner for for uh, setting the scene so comprehensively uh, and explaining also the content of the uh, 2021 uh, European Parliament report. And you were, of course, the rapporteur for um, strengthening uh, the role of the euro in the international um, economy. Thank you so much. Um, there's a lot to unpack here, I think. Um, I wrote down, it's time to reap the potential of the euro, uh, a phrase you used um, at the beginning of your, of your uh, intervention. Uh, but it, it does come as a series or as a result of conscious policy choices, if I if I understood you correctly, that's that's your position. I'm curious to see how our speakers see this. Uh, I'm very curious to hear from them. Uh, before passing uh, the baton to my colleague Isam Halak, who will moderate the event, uh, just a reminder for those of you who are connected via WebEx, you can put in any questions into the chat. Please feel free to ask any questions you wish which Isam will then take up and put to the panel. But now let's start the debate. Uh, Isam, uh, over to you for the introduction of our three distinguished guests and the debate. Thank you, Lasse. Um, so we are going to have now three uh, additional speakers for our panel. Uh, first speaker is Ms. Isabel van Stekiste, who is Director General for International and European Relations at the European Central Bank. Um, she has extensive experience at the ECB. She has worked there since 2002. She held a var variety of executive positions at the ECB, including Deputy Director General at the DG Monetary Policy and at the DG Economics. Then uh, Ms. Sophie Javari will uh, speak. She is Vice Chair of Corporate and Institutional Banking for Europe, Middle East, Africa at BNP Paribas. BNP Paribas, which is EU's largest bank by asset size, and among top world's banks. Uh, at BNP, she provides strategic advice and develops the overall investment banking business with strategic corporate clients and private equity funds. She has a lot of experience in investment banking, where she held uh, positions also in Bank of America, ABN Emerald, and she uh, covered a wide range of large-scale complex financial transactions in capital markets, so she's definitely an expert in that field. And the third, the fourth speaker is Mr. Shin, who is uh, economic advisor and head of research at the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, he uh, co-leads the monetary and economic department. He's also a member of the bank senior management and its executive committee. He was also part of the management team, which developed the BIS Innovation Hub, and he developed the BIS research program on digital innovation and the financial system. So quite some expertise in the field. Um, before joining the BIS, Mr. Sheen was Professor of Economics at Princeton University. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Isam. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen because I wanna use a few slides um, to guide you through my presentation. So um, I'm gonna use my uh, 10 minute slot to Give you a bit of an overview of the developments of the international role of the euro and i'll be um, drawing information in that regard on the report that we've published earlier in this year i mean we every year at the ecb publish a report on the international role of the euro where we cover developments in the international role and we always have also a few topical focuses i understand in the chat the link will also be posted off uh, the report so for anybody who's interested um, please have a look at the report for more details so let me start by um, showing you um, the developments of the uh, international role of the euro in the last couple of years. So this is a chart uh, showing a composite index of the international role of the euro, which is basically a simple average of its share 
And the main indicators of global currency use, so um, this includes the use in international reserves, international bonds, global and foreign exchange. And here, if you focus just on the red circle part at the end, so just zooming on 2021, you can see that the international role of the euro, its international use was broadly unchanged. Um, you see the chart in current exchange rates, um, which is a marginal increase of 0.1, that's the um, yellow line. And at constant exchange rate, which is the blue line, um, is mostly flat. Thanks. So basically, this was the lines I was talking about. Now you're actually also seeing them, hopefully. Um, so this is a historical chart showing the uh, international role of the euro since 1999. And I think what is important, not just zooming in into the very latest period where we see a flat line, but if you look back since 1999, then we can see that the euro's global role currently is actually hovering uh, close to a historical low level. And of course, that's an important fact to note, um, especially when we're discussing in policy fronts uh, how a stronger role of the euro could contribute, for instance, to the EU's strategic autonomy. And that was already something that Ms. Hubner has uh, referred to, and I will come briefly back in the presentation as two factors also that can explain um, the evolutions that we see. Now, just going a little bit in detail into what we've seen over the past years. So this chart basically decomposes uh, into the various components, the, the aggregate chart you saw in the previous slide and looks at changes between end 2021 and end 2020. So over the past year, um, how these selected indicators have moved. And as you can see, this overall aggregate stability of the international use of the euro and the role uh, masks basically um, quite some diverging developments across different categories. So in some categories we saw basically that there was a decline. If you look at the um, extreme right for instance and daily FX settlements we saw a decline of the use of the euro but other indicators we saw actually an increase for instance on, on outstanding international loans or on FX debt issues, we saw actually quite strong growth, but on aggregates, as shown before, this leads to an overall unchanged role of the euro. Now, just zooming into some components where, um, you know, we often refer to when we talk about the international use of currency, and just looking on the left-hand side chart, we see here um, the use of the euro in global foreign exchange reserves. I mean, that's really the most traditional indicator um, that's normally referred to. And we can see over the um, past year, um, on the blue line, this is the share of the euro, and it's indicated on the uh, on the right-hand side shell, the amount. It increased slightly, it's hidden by the right line a bit, but it increased to 21% in 2021. But of course, we're still below the levels that you saw, uh, for instance, in the mid-2000s. Now, at the same time, it's interesting to also look at the yellow line here, which is the dollar, um, where we've seen that the share of the dollar has been really declining uh, quite uh, sharply over the past decade. And um, it's now currently below 60%. I think Barry Eichengreen has labeled this the stealth erosion of the dollar. And we're really now at, uh, at a two decade low in terms of the international use of the dollar in, in global foreign exchanges. Now, so what is moderating this use of, of the euro, for instance, as a global reserve unit? So one factor that we have seen was the sovereign debt crisis left its imprint um, since the mid 2000s on the international use of the euro. But in the recent period, and I mean, we need to see here, this data is from 2021, uh, interest rates were an important factor as well. So in 2021, we had, of course, still negative interest rates. And if you, for instance, had a survey among our reserve managers, uh, for instance, UBS conducts such a survey, uh, we got the information uh, that around 86% of the respondents in 2021 cited this as one of their primary concerns for the investment strategy. Now, at the same time, and that's maybe also important to note, um, the investor sentiment among these official reserve managers was quite positive towards the euro, and they indicated last year that um, around one third of them said they would increase their exposure to the euro going forward. So it will be interesting in uh, future reports and we look at new data, how this evolution has fanned out. Another indicator that's relevant to look at is on the right-hand side chart, which is the international issuance of foreign currency denominated bonds. And here we see actually in 2021, one this uh, market had really a, a bumper year. Issuance overall increased by 10% to around 2 uh, trillion US dollars. Um, and the euro took a quite an important share of that. So, and, and actually also an increasing share. So we again should look here at the blue line. And we saw that the share increased in 2021 in the international issue of foreign currency denominated uh, bonds to almost 25%. Now, of course, here you can see the dollar remains by far the leading currency. 
Um, although there was a decline by around five percentage points in 2021, you see that in the in the yellow lines. Now, just to, to bring everything a little bit together and put it into a, a, a broader perspective, I think Ms. Hubner already mentioned this, the euro basically overall is uh, remains um, the second most important currency globally, you see here across various metrics, uh, the role of, uh, of, of core currencies. And you can see the dollar is clearly the leading currency with um, a role of 40 to 60 percent in some of these market segments. But the euro is more or less hovering in most cases around 20 percent. So uh, significantly below the dollar, but at the same time, of course, also significantly above some other uh, currencies, such as, for instance, the Japanese yen or the Chinese RMB. Now, in the report, these are basically focusing here on general developments. I, I wanted to use um, the few minutes I have left to zoom into two uh, topical aspects. One is uh, the uh, role of the euro as a, a key currency in international green bond markets. I mean, this is a small but rapidly growing segment of the international bond market. And I thought it's important to uh, zoom into this because um, the developments we see there suggest that developing a well-functioning and liquid euro market for sustainable and green finance could bolster the international role of, of the euro. Now, here, as you can see on the left-hand char chart, um, in 2021, we saw that international green bond issuance in uh, euro grew quite appreciably. Um, that's again on the blue line. Um, however, if you look at the, the share, and that's shown on the right-hand side chart, if you look at the decomposition of euro, US dollar, and other currencies, then you see that the share has declined somewhat, though, so about five percentage points, whereas that of the dollar has been increasing by two percentage points. So in, in this market segment, the euro, has taken a disproportionate share compared to other market sentiments in terms of international use. But of course, you see the dollar is to some extent catching up. Now, if, of course, what is a factor that has been bolstering the use of the euro in, in this international green bond market has, for instance, been the next generation EU package. Um, for instance, in October 2021, the years that we're looking here at the data, the Commission issued a 12 billion euro green bond that was the largest ever issuance in this specific market segment and of course the commission continues to issue uh, green bonds i mean the overall plan is around 250 billion and of course that will make uh, as the largest issue of green bonds globally and of course that's an important factor when thinking about the international use of the euro in this market segment the second topic i want to zoom into and we, are, we have also a bit of a focus into the report we had this year um, is basically the impact that we think the russian invasion of Ukraine may have on the international monetary system. I mean, could it alter the importance of major currencies uh, such as the dollar and the euro globally? And of course, this, this discussion has been motivated by, um, you know, some arguing that um, in the context of the sanctions taken by the US and the EU, uh, there could be an encouragement by some countries to bypass the US dollar and the euro. Uh, so for instance, Russia or other countries may try to diversify their portfolios into alternative assets such as the Chinese RMB, gold or crypto assets. And moreover, we could uh, expect, for instance, that international payments could become more segmented. Um, you may remember still that Russia demanded uh, at some point in the year to be paid in rubles for gas exports to what it's called uh, hostile countries. And there are also, for instance, press reports and discussions between Russia and other countries such as China, Saudi Arabia, India, on using local currencies to pay for international trade. And then, of course, you have China's cross-border interbank payment system, which uh, could grow in importance as an alternative to SWIFT, especially with the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Importantly, this research would then also point to this stealth erosion that I alluded to earlier in the global currency uh, um, exchange reserves, I mean, the use of the dollar as a, as a currency in global foreign exchange reserves. And this would argue that potentially the invasion could, could accelerate these developments. So this is, of course, one side of the coin. Um, however, you see there are also other factors that would um, go against this discussion. And I think the first one to note is that the shift in global reserves, for instance, of the dollar, does not necessarily herald broader changes. So, for instance, you saw already earlier in the chart the dollar declining in terms of its use in international reserves, but, for instance, in international bond issues, we actually saw seen quite a steep increase. And uh, an alternative, uh, in addition, and I think even more importantly to stress is that um, the alternatives to the dollar or the euro are just not there. I mean, they lack depth, liquidity, 
and maybe other attributes uh, to appeal to global investors, for instance, uh, certainty, uh, quality of institutions, which are all very important determinants. Um, and here I can also just refer some colleagues of mine have done some research together with Barry Eichengreen, where they find, for instance, that military alliances such as NATO can boost uh, the share of a currency in the military partners' reserves to a significant extent. So all in all, I mean, based on that, one cannot necessarily say that the invasion will bring about fundamental changes. Several forces are pulling in other directions. So it's going to be very interesting to continue to see how this will find out. I mean, time will only tell, but of course, our own policies uh, will also play an important role in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, now, um, third speaker, Isabel Javari. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to stress as a practitioner um, a few elements that uh, would add to the debate. Um, I would uh, make four remarks. My first remark is uh, about the huge need of capital that is going uh, to be needed to finance uh, not only the energy transition in Europe, but also the development of the tech industry and generally the reindustrialization of uh, the EU. Those massive needs of capital uh, by the private sector and the public sector in terms of energy transitions needs to have much deeper, um, more efficient uh, capital markets. So the development of the international role of the EU uh, will inevitably be linked uh, to uh, the development of the capital markets, hence the huge need to accelerate the capital markets union, to accelerate on the listing act for the European Parliament and on various initiatives uh, which need to be taken in order to unify our capital markets, remove barriers between markets, and enable capital flows within our capital markets, which are still uh, undeveloped um, compared with the US market. So if we want to develop our sovereignty, our autonomy, uh, it is extremely important that we develop our capital markets. Within this, uh, and, and this is my second remark, we need to develop the securitization market in, in the EU and in the Euro market. One of the uh, key strengths of the US capital markets and of the dollar in terms of uh, a finance a, a currency to finance the private sector is the ability of uh, banks uh, in, the, uh, in the US to uh, effectively uh, securitize uh, their mortgages, securitize their loans. Uh, so it is absolutely essential given the role that the banks play in the financing of the economy uh, in the euro uh, area, that the securitization market gets accelerated, which is not the case at the moment. My third remark is that um, we have a unique opportunity, in, in my opinion, uh, by having this uh, adequation between the European Union and the euro, which we didn't have until Brexit. With Brexit, uh, there is an opportunity to uh, effectively have a policies which are completely unified between policies that develop the international role of the euro and the European Union. And also we have the opportunity uh, of developing financial centers in Europe to, um, uh, to the expense of London and developing uh, you know, Paris, Frankfurt, Amsterdam as major financial centers. And that should be uh, done by uh, various elements, um, which are effectively uh, the recognition that we are in competition with London now, and we need to be as sophisticated and as modern as the uh, London market, which is accelerating its reforms to be, uh, 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 to continue to have its leads. So, uh, we are competing with the, not only now with the US markets, but with the uh, UK and London market. And we need to make sure that we are autonomous vis-a-vis -vis London in various elements that remain sticky as regards the city. So Brexit has to be taken into account. And with Brexit, what is happening is that a number of our US competitors 
are establishing large headquarters uh, in Frankfurt, in London and Amsterdam, which means that the competition is becoming much harder with European players. Uh, so US uh, financial institutions have the power to invest and could help in the development of those markets, but we should be aware of the market share they have uh, on the capital markets, whether we're talking about equity or debt, and give uh, the power to give enough uh, initiatives and power to uh, uh, the European players so that any development of the capital markets is not done only uh, for the benefit of our US competitors. So this question of, uh, of creating a, a level playing field uh, between, uh, between European players and US banks, and this is links to my remark on securitization, is something of uh, strategic importance. Uh, and my fourth point is linked to uh, the development of the bond market. Uh, we, Isabel mentioned not only uh, um, the fact that now the European Union, the European Commission is issuing safe assets. It's very important that the European Commission continues to be uh, a continuous permanent uh, issuer of safe assets and, and bonds and not only uh, for the uh, next generation EU and show program, and that it becomes something of a routine that the European Commission continues to uh, uh, feed the market with safe assets, because it's one of the strengths of the US capital markets to have a very huge and liquid treasury market. And in that extent, uh, the development of green bond uh, and the ability to uh, effectively have regulation that promote uh, sustainable finance and green bonds in various uh, elements is something, as we have shown by the statistics, that should be extremely positive for uh, cap European capital markets and for the euro and developing its international role. So overall, my address today is to uh, to, in, to say that we should not lose time. We should not lose time on capital markets union. Why? Because we have competition, not only with the US, but with the UK post-Brexit. And we have a huge need of our corporates and our uh, economy generally uh, to finance uh, uh, you know, all what is going to be needed in terms of energy transition, infrastructure, and the rest of it. Uh, so, no, we should not lose time in uh, making our capital markets integration a reality. Thank you. I think the message is very clear. Capital market union, I think it's uh, very important indeed. Next uh, speaker is uh, Jun Shin. The floor is yours. Thank you, Issam, um, and, uh, and thank you for the invitation to this panel. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, Isabel already gave a very uh, good presentation on the facts and figures on the international role of the euro. For my part, let me uh, take you back and give you more of a historical context. And what I would like to do is to draw on um, the BIS uh, triennial survey of um, FX transactions uh, and over-the-counter derivatives. Um, this is a, uh, an exercise uh, that the BIS conducts every three years. And uh, we draw data from our partner central banks. Um, and this year it was 57 central banks. Um, and we compile a picture, uh, both in aggregate terms, but also in, in some specific themes um, on the shape of uh, the foreign exchange market, both in terms of currencies and in terms of instruments, um, and also in terms of the over-the-counter derivatives market. Now, if we uh, go back in time, let's go back to 2001, just after, uh, a couple of years after the launch of the euro. Um, one of the things that has happened since 2001 is that um, uh, there has been uh, a structural shift whereby financial transactions tend to be larger relative to GDP. Now, in 2001, um, the global FX turnover per day 
uh, was something uh, in the order of um, one and a quarter trillion dollars. So every day there was um, uh, one, and a half, uh, one and a quarter trillion dollars. This is a very large number, obviously. Relative to GDP, it's around 3.7%. So um, if you have three weeks or so, then you'd be turning over essentially uh, annual GDP um, in terms of the, uh, you know, if you just added up the daily transactions volume, you're actually uh, um, pretty much turning over annual GDP every three or four weeks. That number uh, has increased substantially over the years. And so uh, in this year's survey, which we published uh, just a few weeks ago, the daily uh, turnover is uh, $7.5 trillion. Uh, so that's a very large number, um, and it's a very large number relative also to GDP. So global GDP, uh, roughly speaking, is around $100 trillion. Um, so we're talking about something in the range of 5.5% uh, of annual GDP being turned over um, every day. Uh, so now, if you like, to, to turn over uh, annual GDP by adding up daily trading amounts, we only have to go, say, two weeks rather than having to go three or four weeks um, as we did before. So what you see in this kind of uh, very long range comparison is that uh, financial transactions in general have become um, a much larger proportion um, of you know, as um, as measured by uh, real economic activity uh, as measured by GDP, for example. Now, um, although um, and Isabel showed us um, in one of her earlier charts that as a share of global currency turnover, the euro has fallen somewhat since uh, the middle uh, in the middle of the two thousands. Um, if we look at the the transactions in euros as a proportion of global GDP. So if we just look at the real world use of the euro, that has actually increased very substantially. So in 2001, um, the transactions in, in euros were around 1.4% of global GDP. So the daily transactions in euros um, was around 1.4% of annual GDP back in 2001. This year, that number uh, rose to 2.4%. So uh, if we were to um, measure things by real activity, uh, by nominal GDP in this case, uh, the real economy, um, the size of the real economy, if you like, the use of the euro has not declined. It's actually increased very substantially. Now, of course, what this means is that uh, uh, if um, if the share of the euro has fallen over this period, what it must mean is that the use of the other currencies has, has increased much more substantially. And I think this is the, the key theme that I would like to draw your attention to. Um, in particular, the way that the dollar has uh, increased um, its use very substantially over the same period um, when measured against uh, global GDP. So to give you uh, a sense, in 2001, um, the daily transactions in US dollars was around 3.3% of annual global GDP. That number uh, is now close to 7%. So it's more than doubled uh, when we normalize by, by global uh, nominal GDP. And I think that points to a very important trend um, in the last 20 years or so which is that financial, the financial sector and uh, the transactions related to banking, capital markets, uh, and all the other um, ancillary activities that are actually part of that has increased very substantially. And so the nature of the economic system um, has undergone, um, in this sense, a very important transformation. Now, one of the um, very important factors to bear in mind uh, when we think about the the resilience um, of the dollar as the as the premier uh, global currency, 
is the is how various economic transactions uh, are interlinked and they tend to reinforce um, the status quo. So uh, to give you a very simple example, and I will uh, layer it in my in my explanation. So let's start with uh, the invoicing of international trade. So when we invoice, um, we uh, and we invoice um, uh, to the uh, the buyer in this instance, we have a choice in how to invoice. But typically, um, the invoice share of the dollar is actually very large. It's um, Gita Gopinath at the IMF has done a number of important studies. The share of the dollar is um, is well over 50% in this case. Now, when you invoice in dollars, um, but you need working capital, then it makes sense to finance um, working capital. It makes sense to borrow uh, for uh, trade financing purposes in the same currency, because this would minimize the currency risk. And therefore, it uh, it makes sense to, um, so it, it mitigates risk if you uh, try and match your currency of invoicing with the currency that you borrow for trade financing purposes. And so you tend to borrow in dollars and typically from uh, uh, international banks because they're the ones who can also perform other ancillary services like um, letters of credit and other financial services that, that go with that. Similarly, um, if you are on if you're an oil producer um, or you produce a commodity uh, which is invoiced in dollars, and typically commodities are invoiced in dollars in this instance, again, it pays to borrow uh, in the same currency in order to minimize the currency risk. So if you're, uh, if you're, an, oil exp uh, if you're an oil exporter or if you're an oil exploration firm uh, and your revenue, your cash flow uh, is coming in dollars, then uh, it makes sense to borrow in dollars in the capital markets, for example, by issuing a corporate bond denominated in dollars in order that you can uh, mitigate the currency risk that comes. Now, given that, what it means is that there is a preponderance of dollar denominated instruments in the capital markets because uh, the instruments that firms uh, and some emerging market governments as well uh, issue in the in the capital markets are heavily represented by uh, those instruments that are invoiced that are that are denominated in the invoicing currency, and so there is a very large issuance of dollar denominated instruments uh, in the capital markets that flow very naturally from the invoicing, and so the um, the initial step of invoicing choices then has a ripple effect into the currency denomination uh, of capital markets. So there is a uh, spillover to, to the capital market uh, structure as well. Now, there are even further repercussions of this because um, if you are a life insurance company uh, or a pension fund and uh, you hail from a country that doesn't use either the euro or the dollar, um, but you're coming from a wealthy country so that your portfolio tends to be very large, then typically your, por your portfolio will have a very heavy representation uh, of instruments that are denominated in global currencies like the dollar and the euro. Because that is uh, in fact how the capital markets uh, have developed. Now, here is the very important part where you know, uh, the mutually reinforcing effect really kicks in if you're a life insurance company or a pension fund um, that, uh, let's say, uh, is located here in Switzerland, where I am, your obligations to your policyholders, your obligations to your beneficiaries are actually in Swiss francs rather than in these global currencies. Therefore, there is a need to hedge uh, the currency risk that actually flows from holding a global portfolio with a very heavy representation of dollars and euros. And how do you hedge? Well, you would hedge by approaching a global bank and engaging in an FX swap. You, uh, you actually borrow dollars 
in order to invest in these dollar instruments uh, with the agreement that you unwind uh, that borrowing at a prearranged exchange rate at the end of the term of the swap. And what that means is that uh, all of these choices now are now interlinked. So the invoicing leads to capital market choices. Capital market choices leads to uh, the composition of capital market instruments. Capital market instruments choices means that uh, uh, anyone with a global portfolio needs hedging services and hedging services uh, will tend to also reinforce the, the uh, initial choices. So what uh, you see is that there are these very um, uh, mutually, the mutually reinforcing pieces that tend to fit together. And um, there is, if you like, in the game theory jargon, there is a coordination problem here. There is a network effect where the more um, other market participants use a particular currency, uh, the more you would also use, the, use that currency because um, it is more liquid, uh, there is greater chance of uh, being able to hedge, there are thicker markets, and so on. And so um, when we put the two together, so two being, the first being this general change in the structure of financial markets, so there's been a greater financialization, if you like, of the global economy, together with the mutually reinforcing uh, nature of the actions of all the participants, um, we do see this tendency uh, for the dollar in particular to be remarkably resilient in, in maintaining um, its, uh, its leading share. And uh, consistent with the, with the narrative that I've just presented to you, what we found uh, this year, as in previous triannual surveys, is that the FX swap segment of the FX transactions uh, occupies a very, very important role, and that's the segment that has been growing. And that's very consistent with the idea that uh, uh, the hedging services that are needed when a do dollar plays such an important role globally, but your obligations are to your uh, domestic policyholders, your domestic uh, beneficiaries in your local currency. Um, um, and so the the result is that we have this mutually reinforcing effect. So the bottom line is that um, although the share of the euro has fallen, it reflects partly the increase in the denominator. So there's just much more financial transactions that are out there. As a fraction of real economic activity, I think the euro um, is what well, it, it has grown very substantially. And uh, uh, within the, um, the region uh, that is um, adjacent to the euro area, the, uh, not only the non-euro area Europe, uh, but also the, uh, the other regions that are close to Europe, um, there we do see a much more important role of the euro uh, in trade invoicing, for example. And uh, I think the role of the euro is secure in that respect. Uh, but it has not played, um, it has not um, benefited to the same extent as the dollar uh, in the huge um, uh, impetus that has come from the financialization um, of the global economy. Let me, let me stop there, Isam. Thank you for this uh, demonstration that the winners take it all, basically. Um, Maybe I would uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Hübner if she if she wants to open the the debate, the discussion. I uh, well, sorry, I I just I, first of all thank you very much because the the, the three panelists have addressed uh, from different perspectives the issues which are absolutely fundamental for uh, for us today and which are part of also I think of the uh, of what is behind the European legislation and what is uh, behind also the actions um, in the context of Brexit or when we talk about the trade or about the everything starts with invoicing or pricing in, in a concrete uh, currency. This is something which is of concern to us, which actually has been one of the major elements also of the reflection by the Commission and the communication of the Commission at the beginning of this uh, uh, international role of euro um, uh, policy exercise that we are doing. So thank you very much actually in confirming the, the right path that the EU is, is choosing. But to, to Mr. Shin, um, 
I think it's it's um, it's w w once you understand the whole process, you think you can uh, do um, uh, what is needed to to also not to be a loser, but to use this accumulation of next steps that would just provide uh, you with capacity to to also get the the increase of your share in the global turnover, not only of your uh, volume. Uh, the, the issue is that uh, the decisions are made largely by uh, by those who are behind the transactions. So we have, in, in case of uh, Europe, we have uh, actually key European companies that opt to, to trade in, in uh, important strategic markets in, in dollar. I'm thinking here, for example, of the aircraft. And uh, so to, to change it, uh, but there are many examples, and uh, it's not only at the level of the physical sort of material economy or, or but also financial uh, markets so, so the the to have a you cannot do it directly you have to do it through the policies that would incentivize also those um, uh, the traders or the or the companies so so this is actually the big challenge for uh, for Europe that so far we have been trying to avoid the the sort of uh, very restrictive policies uh, that might also have bad impact on the effectiveness of the of the trade but we were trying to to create incentives and that's actually what i think the policy today is is, is about the same we are now doing the uh, amending the the emir uh, the clearing um, uh, regulation in the context of the uh, the, the denominated in uh, euro um, uh, transactions, which are cleared mostly in, in UK, just very briefly and in short without entering into details. So our approach is uh, not to act against the, the other partners in the global, because markets are global, but to increase attractiveness of a uh, European Union. Actually, I would like to ask you, how do you see what, what is the fundamental things to make a, a Europe an attractive place that would just um, bring the, the investors uh, that would just provide instruments that would also look more attractive. We, we talked a lot about safe assets, uh, but uh, there's more uh, to, to discuss uh, here. So what is the, the fundamental thing for the attractiveness of European financial and capital markets that could also encourage this beginning with pricing um, and, and terminating with uh, the end, the, the increasing share of euro in, in the turnover uh, globally. Well, Professor Hubner, I think you, you already covered many of the issues actually in your in your opening uh, presentation. So um, I'm not sure that I can add much to that. Um, what I would say though, is that uh, to some extent, um, if we look at the overall numbers, um, Yes, it's true that the that the proportion of total transactions uh, that are in euros uh, are now lower today than they were in the early 2000s. Um, but to a large extent, as uh, just to uh, reiterate uh, what I was saying, that reflects an increase in the size of the denominator. And uh, uh, in the early 2000s, of course, we we had uh, the run up to the, uh, the great financial crisis when the financial sector, in particular global banking, was expanding at a very fast rate and in retrospect um, at a rate that was not uh, sustainable or even desirable. Um, so to that extent, um, I think it, it would be uh, important to keep, uh, if you like, the objectives um, uh, you know, with, with reference to um, if you like some real world activities as well as simply the share. I think if we focus on the share, um, we tend to miss the denominator sort of expanding very much. And to some extent, um, although financialization of the global economy has, uh, you know, brings some benefits, there are also downsides uh, clearly as well. Uh, so it's not a, a completely an ambiguous, um, uh, you know, benefit, um, uh, you know, in that respect. So, um, um, but there are some, if you like, very basic points of, uh, of principle that, uh, you know, um, flow from the mutually reinforcing story that I told earlier. Uh, the way that I presented the case, I um, did it in terms of layers where I said, uh, of course, you know, it's, it's invoicing first and then borrowing next um, and then capital markets on top and, and so on. Uh, that might give the impression that we just have to fix the invoicing. 
but of course invoicing is a, is a market choice as well. It is also a choice made by those who trade. And that is determined by the availability of trade credit, the availability of financing. So invoicing and financing would also be mutually dependent. So I think it's, um, um, I think there are, there are uh, some things that one might do at the margin uh, in particular to increase the attractiveness uh, to invoice in euros or, uh, you know, there may be some conventions that are um, uh, better, um, uh, you know, set in, in, in euro terms rather than in dollar terms. But in general, um, uh, if we respect the, the choices of individual economic uh, agents, it would be, I think, uh, um, and I think it would be unrealistic to to suggest that this could somehow be engineered uh, through through uh, policy. I think there are some uh, some policies that might be um, uh, in place at the margin, but probably the most important thing is something that you mentioned in your presentation, which is um, the idea of um, uh, open markets, the rule of law, uh, those kind of very basic uh, foundations uh, of um uh of if you like the the stability of capital markets um that would ultimately serve um serve per, uh serve well in um further establishing the role of the euro as i said in my presentation i think there is no doubt that the euro is very well established and it uh it has already achieved uh really quite a remarkable role in the uh, 20 or so years since its uh, launch um, in our latest uh, triennial survey, uh, the euro um, takes around 30 or 31 percent of all FX transactions. Uh, so the euro figures in around 30 percent um, of FX transactions, um, which is a very, very large number. I mean, that is still less than, of course, the, the, the dollar. I mean, the dollar is something like 88 percent. And of course, these two numbers add up to more than 100 because we're talking about FX transactions where there are two currencies to every, to every trade. But 30 is still a very, very large number. Anyone want to uh, reply or start asking some questions? If there's nobody to ask questions, I could just continue asking. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Because I, I, I really appreciate very much what was said today and the choice of panelists was absolutely perfect from our needs perspective. I mean, the European Parliament. And I'd like to, to ask Sophie Javari uh, uh, maybe a question because you, you, you mentioned something which is very sort of important for, for me personally in, in the Parliament that the safe assets by the Commission and that, you know, we are obsessively saying that the um, uh, RRF, the famous Recovery and Resilience Fund, is actually one of events, and you were just very strongly supporting the idea of having it as a permanent mechanism, actually, the, the European Union being an issuer of, of uh, bonds that it, you even said the routine, uh, which, is, uh, which is politically, of course, uh, as you know, uh, difficult, but I hope that the uh, at the end of the day, we will just all agree that this is the, the way to go uh, toward the future and that we need safe assets and this will be the, the instruments offered in, in Europe. So this will have also a fundamental, I think, uh, at the end of the day, benefit, bring a benefit for uh, European um, Union. But where, where I tend to disagree with you on is a different issue. So thanking for safe assets, but then you talk about the capital market and you said that actually trying to build a, a European less fragmented uh, bigger in size uh, European market and more uh, more less fragmented. So, which is you, you talked about integrity, which I understand that um, which you saw as is not needed in action uh, and a lo loss of time, a uh, waste of time actually. Probably I should say. So, wh why do you why do you say it? Why why don't you need the the? You, I understand you believe that. Uh, Europe, which is consisting of a small, divided, uh, not only probably a alongside the, the national borders, but also there are silos, as we know, 
uh, in which um, uh, instruments uh, find the, themselves. And uh, so why do you think that it would be a waste of time? Don't you see the, the potential of the uh, less fragmented uh, European market as a market that would be more interested also not only for European investors but also for foreign investors. Could you just justify your your focus? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I I was saying basically that we should not waste time in uh, uh, effectively promoting capital markets union, and I would give you a few examples. Uh, one is we don't have unified bankruptcy regulations uh, within uh, Europe, and that is certainly detrimental to the development of a, of a bond market on which investors can uh, effectively understand what would happen in case of a restructuring or in case of, uh, uh, of a bankruptcy, which is the case in the US if you invest in a high yield issued by a corporate in the US you know exactly what is a chapter 11 what is a chapter what would happen in case of a problem on the company in the in the europe if you are an outside investor or even a, an investor within europe it is not very clear what would happen in a case of a bankruptcy in poland versus in france versus in germany versus uh, in the netherlands so that's one example where we have a fragmentation Another example is uh, the fact that we don't have uh, a, a unified regulator in terms of securities. So in the US, you have the SEC. In, in Europe, uh, we have not been uh, bold enough in promoting the role of ESMA as a unique regulator that would approve prospectuses, that would uh, basically have the uh, same rule for listing and for admitting securities on, the, on an exchange. So those are two examples where we, if we don't do that, then we'll have underdeveloped capital markets in Europe. Well, and, thank and you. That can only come from uh, from only come by by the polit uh, the political will. And the European Parliament's, uh, you know, dedication to making those uh, uh, elements progress. Well, thank you very much again. You said about ESMA as a unique supervisor. It's again extremely uh, important for many of us that we, uh, but it's politically also very difficult. But I hope we will make a step forward with our uh, current uh, work on on the several legislative acts regarding the capital markets. So I hope that we will move in in this direction that you just um, uh, mentioned. Uh, thanks uh, for this. And now I understand better. I think your your understanding. I, I guess that. Uh, um, uh, we, we, of course, the, we look at different and other jurisdictions. We look at what the UK is, is doing, especially as they floated away with with the European capital market, and now we are uh, watching how they are how they are really seeing the further development of the British capital market and the, uh, how they make it attractive. And we we are also uh, hoping that uh, we will manage to. Um, to find the compromises, which is a nightmare, a European nightmare, as you know, uh, we will find the compromises that will also make the European capital market sufficiently attractive to 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 just attract the the, the capital, because we, as you said, we we have huge investment um, uh, needs, and uh, I don't I don't want to monopolize questions, but if there's again nobody, I I have also other. I, so. I actually would have a question, so um, I I like the uh, how. Uh, Pinchin uh, made very clear this interconnection. So it's very actually, it's what I, what I understand is that actually it's very hard to uh, understand the causality at the end of the day. So he started with the uh, invoicing, but the invoicing itself was probably determined by the fact that you could access to debt market, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, so Ms. Jal uh, Sophie Jalari, Jalari came with some fixes and said, okay, well, we have a capital market union having a, a, a more integrated market. I mean, the bankruptcy court is an excellent example, I think as well. Um, actually, I would the secretization is is a, is kind of new to me in the picture. It's very interesting, um, but and and the Brexit and also, but when I look then at the uh, at the uh, graphs that uh, is that they presented, I noticed that uh, we were growing in terms of uh, of share until two thousand eight, two thousand ten, and when we started the banking union, I mean we 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 took. Uh, 
big actions uh, in terms of capital market union, banking union, we actually decrease. So probably it's disconnected. And maybe we actually uh, mean we uh, uh, soften, let's say, uh, the uh, the impact. Maybe it relates more to the sovereign aspect, sovereign debt aspect, and which maybe uh, probably give more uh, comfort in the uh, in one of the arguments of uh, Sophie Javari, which is the uh, unified uh, fiscal uh, uh, um, issuance of debt. Did I understand it well? Shall I maybe uh, jump in and then? Of course, uh, any of you. I'm okay. trying to try to get a connection between all speakers. Yes. Um, I mean, I think when um, you know, it's 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 the difference between causation and and, and correlation, and uh, you know, you just happen to see things happen at the same time. It doesn't mean one is the the cause behind the other. Actually, I think uh, the banking union and the responses that we saw of the crisis were a response to the crisis. Um, and so what you you may have seen partly is, in, in fact, this impact of, of the sovereign debt crisis also in the international world of the EU, that it's had a, a negative imprint. I mean, there are also other factors, right? So I, I mentioned in the more recent period, so the negative interest rate um, also, um, you know, had, had some impacts. And also what you saw, for instance, if you look at, at, at foreign um, global reserves, um, what you see is more of a diversification by reserves holders. So they move away from Euro to maybe also smaller uh, currencies, um, which are also very stable, such as the Swedish Krona. I'm just giving an example here, right? I don't want to uh, single out one particular one or Australian dollar. And so, of course, you see these factors also being at play. So I think it's a combination of factors that you see. Um, but I would say if you would have uh, uh, drawn a counterfactual without the banking union, uh, maybe you would see uh, actually a weaker uh, international role of the euro, because we do see that that has been an important factor. And of course, having deep liquid capital markets are very important as well. So, I mean, I think you know, just repeating the theme that we already had in this discussion, I mean, these are all factors that are very important. And I think as Hyun has mentioned, I mean, things are very much interlinked, right? So it's a bit of a chicken and the egg problem. So, um, you know, but um, actions on all these fronts, of course, can help to um, you know, foster the international role of the euro and, and the international appeal. And I think as you have mentioned, also some factors that are underlying all of that, that you know, we may be taking for granted or we don't think about every day, such as the rule of law, just the general stability of your legal system of, of, of a country, have of course also um, are important factors when we think about you know, foreign investors wanting to use a currency or, or, or park their money in, in, in the country. So yeah, I would say that would be my uh, kind of uh, reaction to, to that question. I would like not to, to continue yeah. his comments, but I would like to use the opportunity that we have the ECB and also BIS here, and both banks have been strongly involved in the digital euro. So I would very much appreciate the, if, if Mr. Hyun Sung Shin could just say a few words on, on what currently BIS, because BIS has been recently very active in, 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 in moving forward. Uh, how, how do you see the process also with regard to, to euro and if, if if um, uh, also we could hear from Isabella a comment that would be very useful just to have also the digital euro being here because we know the digital currencies of the central banks, they also have to tend to have impact on, on uh, shifting people away or towards uh, uh, the currency, the physical currency. Thank you. Let me just uh, uh, mention a few general points, um, uh, leaving aside the euro uh, for the moment, but just, just more generally. Uh, the BIS has been very actively engaged um, in the last couple of years um, in thinking about central bank digital currencies, um, or more broadly, the monetary system that has um, central bank money um, as the basis for, for the monetary system. And uh, we're thinking of uh, central bank digital currencies, not simply as an, an isolated uh, project, if you like, but rather more in the design of the monetary system. And the idea would be that uh, the unit of account is issued by the central bank, and from that unit of account uh, flow the promises that ultimately um, uh, inform all the other promises um, in the economy itself. So the the actual um, transactions that underlie everything uh, is ultimately based on that unit of account. And uh, one of the very important functions, and just as the you know there is a mutual def uh, dependence among different users, 
in the capital markets. There is also a very important network effect um, in the users of uh, the monetary system and the associated settlement system. So money is a classic uh, coordination device, which is to say, uh, if we can all coordinate on the use of a particular medium of exchange, then uh, that leads to uh, uh, larger markets, more vibrant markets. Um, that means that it's easier for me to transact. And so um, when we approach this question from the point of view of uh, the monetary system and the design of the monetary system, we, we uh, put at the center uh, the role of the central bank um, as being, if you like, the guardians of the monetary system. And from that, of course, everything else is built on top. Now, um, the, the actual technology itself, um, we think is secondary, but clearly there is a link between the technology and uh, the use of uh, central bank money or uh, private sector issued money that is ultimately rooted in the settlement on the central bank. Um, and this is why we've been um, very um, uh, we've been very active in exploring the design of central bank digital currencies, uh, especially architecture that's based on uh, a um, the interoperability of uh, uh, of different applications that uh, plug into the monetary system, as well as the uh, the competitive aspects and financial inclusion. So what are the, some of the features that are more conducive to interoperability, uh, wider markets, and competition among service providers that actually promotes financial inclusion? And then in that respect, um, uh, we are of the view, uh, and I think this is quite common among uh, all our central bank colleagues, that uh, whether it be a CBDC as such, which is a direct liability of the central bank, or a retail fast payment system, or some other settlement system, as long as uh, the whole system is rooted in the central bank uh, uh, settlement accounts, then many of the same economic benefits uh, flow from that. It's a very different kind of uh, approach from uh, the approach that crypto takes, which is to take the technology uh, as the basis and then try and build everything on top. Um, if anything, um, the, uh, the emergence of private uh, currencies, if you like private networks, um, uh, and that was a very important discussion back in 2019 with the emergence of Libra, uh, the Libra proposal from Facebook um, and other big tech uh, firms on the one hand, and then with crypto and stable coins, uh, which are crypto related payment uh, instruments um, on the other. So if you take either crypto or big tech platforms, um, in a way they are, um, uh, yeah, the, they are potentially, they could turn out to be potentially competitors to the central bank. Um, and to reap the benefits of network effects, um, you know, we have argued that it's important to uh, bring them into the fold, as it were, um, to actually make them interoperable. Um, whether crypto is interoperable, I think that is still up for debate. But certainly with private sector um, payment instruments, um, certainly having it um, ultimately rooted in central bank money would be, you know, would be a very important uh, issue. And I think in this respect, uh, central bank digital currencies, uh, the projects that are now, on, uh, now underway at the ECB and elsewhere, and um, I'll leave it to Isabel to talk about the ECB's digital euro project. Um, those kind of initiatives dovetail very nicely with other policy, initi uh, policy initi initiatives, for example, um, the Digital Markets Act, um, the, um, and other uh, initiatives that are designed to promote competition, data privacy, data ownership, and the other initiatives that we have in other areas, um, both in competition, financial services, um, and uh, as, as uh, is also in train, the, um, the Mika 
uh, proposals uh, to regulate crypto as well. But let me uh, hand over to Isabel. Let me maybe complement what, what Hyun has said because it gives uh, the, the general picture here. And I think the BS had actually a nice chapter in its annual report this year on, on, on CBDC and, and, and how it ties in with, with the world of crypto and, and stable coins and, and CBDCs being basically the anchor in the digital world uh, or the trunk of the tree, I think Hyun nicely presented it as. I mean, at ECB, basically, we, we have indeed, I mean, uh, I think it's quite widely known now, uh, engaged into uh, looking into a digital euro project. I mean, we're currently in this investigation phase. It was launched um, in July 2021, and it's expected to last 24 months. I mean, so, I mean, the first question is, of course, why are we looking into that? No? And I think Kyun gave already the general motivation. That's also the factors that that to avoid decision no to have a digital euro as a kind of monetary anchor, let's say in the digital age that uh, would preserve public access to central bank money and that would be widely accessible for users uh, across the euro area. And it's kind of uh, a way to defend monetary sovereignty among also potential rise of foreign uh, private digital monies in the euro area or foreign CBDCs. And uh, it of course also generally supports the digitalization of, of the European economy, right? So, so these are, are the reasons uh, why we're looking into it in terms of scope um, of, of what we're looking at is of course, and I think we, we have to repeat that time and time again, but it's important to say it's a complement, not a substitute for cash and a wholesale central bank deposits. And of course, supervised institutions, intermediaries um, will be important in the distribution of the digital euro and it should serve as a source of innovation and a public good. So it should not crowd out uh, banks uh, or innovations in payments. Um, now in this investigation phase, what, what we are looking into currently is um, particularly, for instance, the prioritization of use cases for a digital euro. So, so which cases should be prioritized? Also define a business model for supervised intermediaries, merchants, and citizens within the digital euro ecosystem. Then define a potential functional design that meets the user's needs and uh, needs, and identify changes in legislation that would be to required um, that go along with introducing such a digital euro. And then finally, also identify a, a service provider that would potentially develop this digital euro. So all these factors we are looking into for the moment, as I said, I mean, this will uh, last into uh, well into 2023, at which point, of course, uh, the governing council um, would uh, potentially take a decision on the realization phase. So once uh, these questions have been answered and discussed, um, you know, we we'll move to the next phase. And of course, all along this process, uh, you know, we have, of course, been discussing with uh, uh, European lawmakers, right? Uh, uh, Mr. Panetta regularly, I think, comes to the European Parliament to discuss this topic, but also our president presents in the Eurogroup quite often on, on the various aspects. And, and, and we have, of course, task forces at various levels to discuss and, and, and to agree on these various aspects. So this is in, 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 in a bird's eye view where we stand on the digital euro. And of course, in, in, the, in the context of, uh, of uh, the international role of the euro, I mean, this, this is, of course, also an important element to discuss, uh, given that we're moving to a digital age. And, you know, this, this second factor I, I, I mentioned in a way, you know, this defending the monetary sovereignty, um, you know, you can call it that the extreme of fear of moving uh, uh, FOMO, no fear of missing out uh, as at one extent, but it's also a proactive approach uh, to be ready and, and, and to have this monetary anchor still there in the digital age, which would be very important also for the international role of the EU going forward. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a couple of questions from the audience. So the first question is, um, whether um, there would be an impact for the euro, the fact that we have a growing uh, common debt. I think we already addressed that. I would add whether would this would be sufficient. And um, the second uh, question is to give a broader picture of the, uh, um, the place, the position of the euro compared to other co currencies. Um, and if there's uh, how euro is positioned in a world where the very center of the world can switch somewhere else. I can uh, start. Um, uh, certainly, borrowing in one's own currency is um, uh, is really the basic uh, step. And in this respect, actually, um, even emerging market borrowers, even emerging market sovereigns, have uh, overcome original sin uh, in in the sense of um, um, in the sense of Eichen Green and Hausman, where. You know, he 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 described how uh, in the early 90s, um, 
emerging markets were borrowing from foreigners in foreign currency. Now, emerging markets tend to actually borrow in their own currencies. I think the for the international use of a currency, however, I think what's uh, in a way a key touchstone is whether um, a borrower who is unrelated to the issuing government or issuing um, country nevertheless um, borrows you know, in that currency. Uh, that's clearly the case in the, uh, uh, for the dollar. So I you know, mentioned, for example, oil producers who issue a dollar denominated bond, uh, even though the oil producer may be from uh, you know, Brazil or Mexico, uh, someone who is uh, uh, you know, not coming from the US. Um, and it's coming uh, primarily because of the invoicing you know, practices um, you know, in the energy market. So I, I would say that is the touchstone of greater internationalization. Do you see uh, third parties who are you know, borrowing in your currency? Uh, or indeed, do you see borrowers who use your currency as a vehicle currency? Uh, where uh, you know it is intermediating between two legs of a transaction in order to um, put into effect a uh, a transaction between two currencies that are that are neither you know uh, the neither of which would be the euro. Anyone else? We have a very few minutes. I mean, maybe just on this question on the common uh, debts, uh, you know, if you would have more common debt in Europe, no, I mean. At least, uh, I think at the ECB, we, 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 for instance, say it's important to have a central fiscal capacity, and that's, of course, um, just for the stability and the resilience of the of the monetary union itself. You think that's so in, in its own right, it's a good thing to do. Um, you know, would it promote uh, international use of the euro? Well, I mean, it would uh, most likely lead to a more deep and liquid uh, financial market and a more common uh, integrated financial market, and in that sense, uh, it, it would of course be helpful. But I think the main reason why we are at least would would see it important is just for the for the monetary union itself, basically that you have this fiscal capacity that can can deal with large adverse common shocks, basically. But but um, I think the side effect indeed could be um, that it could lead to more liquid, deep uh, financial markets that that can help basically the international role of the euro. Maybe you want to add the last word for conclusions. Uh, maybe Hugh, you start if you want to add a, a word. No, this has been a very rich discussion, uh, Isam. Um, just to say thank you and uh, 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 thanks to the other panelists. Okay. Um, Ms. Chab Isabel Savary, do you want to add something? Well, thank you very much. No, it's been extremely useful to have all the uh, the various opinions. Um, no, I would stress, I think it was interesting, the link between invoicing and financing of trade. And uh, that is inevitably linked also to the role of European banks, because the uh, trade finance in, in many instances uh, provided to exporters in the European Union by European banks. And with inflation of energy prices and generally of uh, commodities, uh, this has meant uh, an increasing uh, need of companies. That's what we have noticed in the recent months. Uh, and uh, the need to uh, effectively, uh, that that will, will make the link between securitization and the ability of trade finance through the balance sheet of banks. Um, Isabel? No, just also thanks a lot from my side. I think we had complimentary views, so it was a very uh, good and, and interesting discussion that we had here. Maybe just the thing to stress when we talk about all these policies on on, on promoting international rules of a currency, which are what I was alluding to in my last answer. I mean, most of them actually, actually all of them are good in their own right to pursue. So you know, if, if you look at the list of factors uh, in a textbook of what uh, promotes international use of a currency, we would want to do them anyway. So I think there's only win-win in, in, in pursuing those policies, and that should be something important to underline as well. But thanks again for, uh, for inviting me. And uh, Professor Hibna. Thank you. I just would like to, to raise very briefly the, the two issues as when we are dis discussing the, the invoicing or pricing or whatever you, you call it. And I, I would like to say that we already know that it's difficult if you have the sort of well-established markets with uh, well-established participation of the um, main or key uh, companies. It's very difficult to make them shift to other currency, uh, even from dollar to euro, probably. But that's why 
for Europe, it's important that all the new markets that are now emerging, actually, with uh, regard to energy-related um, commodities, especially the, the sustainable energy, renewable energy, that this is probably the, the chance for Europe, if we if we are smart from the beginning, to uh, to 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 sort of get euro uh, as the invoicing currency into those new uh, newly emerging uh, markets. And the second thing that probably, I don't know if you agree with, I hope you agree with me, that we have to look at what Russia and China are doing with the, not only with the digital versions of their currencies, but also that they are actually now imposing on the debtors the, uh, the obligation to pay them back uh, in their own currencies, just trying to understand to, to somehow impose this, just or start this uh, uh, growth of the relevant of their own currencies, but of course today there are still margins, but they have, I don't know how smart this policy is, but it can be also effective, if we, so we have to watch it. Thank you. And thank you for, for, for organizing this discussion. For me, it was extremely useful. I learned a lot, so thank you. So thank you very much to the four of you. Uh, I think uh, it's very appreciable that we have uh, four uh, different points of view on the same uh, issue. Uh, it was interesting to see uh, the interconnection between the different factors, and I uh, I think it's also interesting to have these four very clear uh, directions given by uh, Isabel Javari, especially the securitization, which uh, I, I found it pretty new in the picture. I mean, maybe it was more known for other speakers. Um, with this, uh, I will conclude the, um, the debate. I just want to remind you that tomorrow we have an EPRS EU history roundtable on President Lord Planck, who was a uh, president of the parliament uh, tomorrow another EPRC roundtable. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.